Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Frank Close, author of Antimatter. Frank is Professor of Physics at Oxford, and among the many posts he has held in his career, are Vice President of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and Head of Communications at CERN in Switzerland. His previous books include The Particle Odyssey and The Void, an Exploration of Nothingness. So perhaps it's a logical step to go from writing on nothingness to an exploration of antimatter, the diametric opposite of matter, which is so beloved of science fiction writers. I asked Frank if his interest in antimatter dated back a long way. Yes, my, my father was an accountant, and he taught me numbers before I'd even started school. Magic things, like if a number ends in five or zero, you can divide it by five. And if the digits add up to three, six or nine, it'll divide by three and things like that. So I always found numbers very easy to get on with. And he also kept asking questions. And at the time, I didn't realise how profound they would be in making me ask questions. Particular questions that I start antimatter with was, what happens when the irresistible force meets the immovable object? He seemed to be obsessed with that. He kept asking it. And I sort of realised that was a catch. I mean, I couldn't quite articulate as a kid why, but I knew that you couldn't really have immovable and irresistible. And, of course, now I realise it was the paradox of infinity. Is my infinity bigger than your infinity? But the other question that he asked was, how would you contain a substance that destroyed everything it came in contact with? And I found that quite scary. And I'm talking here, you know, when you're five or six years old. Because the idea that uh, a substance would destroy everything it came in contact with meant that it would destroy the container. And now it's out there in the open destroying whatever it comes in contact with, eventually you and me. And I thought that was a bit worrying. And I thought, well, this is science fiction. Actually, I was wrong because antimatter, in a way, is that very substance. It does destroy anything it comes in contact with. The good news is that it destroys itself as well. So it's not something that, like some horrible virus, is destroying and going out bigger and bigger and eventually destroying the whole world and the universe. Antimatter doesn't exist in large amounts. We have to make it an atom or a particle at a time. And it very quickly destroys another atom or particle. So antimatter isn't an all-destroying substance because there isn't any of it around, as far as we know. Of course, if there were, then the universe would be a very interesting place. Now, you say there isn't any of it around as far as we know, but in the book, you deal with the hypothesis that a huge area of Russia, which was devastated in 1908, was possibly the result of antimatter entering the Earth's atmosphere. Yes, I, I say that you know, antimatter doesn't exist in bulk, as far as we know. Actually, that itself is a big question. Why? Because everything that we have done in experiments at CERN and anywhere else suggests that matter and antimatter are, in a strange way, a perfect opposite to each other. And so if they are so perfectly balanced, and the energy of the Big Bang produce matter, such as you and me, and antimatter, its faithful opposite, and as everybody who's followed Star Trek knows, matter and antimatter annihilate when they meet, then how come is it a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, the universe hadn't self-destructed? Something tipped the balance. Quite what and how, we don't know. That's one of the big questions of the 21st century. But something did tip the balance, such that all the antimatter got destroyed, leaving some matter left over. And that some matter left over is the whole material universe that we're now part of. But, of course, it's possible that out there somewhere there is antimatter. If there is, then once in a while, maybe, we might, lump, we might uh, bump into a bit. Mm. And you don't need to bump into very much for it to have a big effect. That uh, you know, If you had a lump of antimatter the size of the trunk of a car, if that hit the atmosphere, it would make an explosion that would be seen and felt around the world. And that is the intriguing thing about the... Tunguska event, as it's called, in 1908. Something definitely hit the atmosphere. The question is what? Why is this particularly unusual? After all, things hit in the atmosphere all the time, and periodically lumps of rock hit the ground and leave craters, like the Arizona meteor crater, for example. The only thing that was interesting about Tunguska is that it is the biggest thing that has happened in 
recorded history when somebody was around to notice it. And people were around in Tunguska when there was this flash of light in the sky, there was blast wave, the forest was destroyed, laid waste, an area the size of Greater London. So this is giving you a feeling for the size of the thing. But there was no crater left. There was no stuff remaining. You go and dig a hole in the ground, you will not find any obvious meteoric material. So the question is, what was it? And one possibility is that if indeed there was just a, a rock, not very big, uh, the size of, as I said, the trunk of a car, that uh, had hit the atmosphere and made of antimatter, those have been the sort of effects that would have arisen. And so the possibility that antimatter hit Tunguska just over 100 years ago is something that people have seriously thought about. And scientists indeed have investigated this. I don't know whether I should be giving the punchline here, but you read the book and you'll find out what the reality is. Now, that happened 100 years ago, but antimatter as a concept dates back only 80 years. And I thought one of the intriguing things about it, which I got from your book, was that the mathematician who came up with it, as it were, or who posited its existence, was working in a theoretical realm rather than, he wasn't a, an experimenter in a lab, he was someone who was, who was using the power of reason in order to, to, to posit the existence of antimatter. Yes, this is Paul Dirac, the mathematician working in Cambridge. It is one of the profound things that, even though I'm a professional scientist for many years, I still don't really understand that you scribble equations on a piece of paper. That's what he was doing. He was scribbling equations on a piece of paper. He was trying to combine the two great theories of the 20th century. The theory of quantum mechanics, which describes very small things like atoms, or in particular the constituents of atoms, the simplest of which is the electron. That was what he was interested in. And he also wanted to use the other big theory, which is Einstein's theory of relativity, which describes what happens when things move very fast. Well, electrons can move very fast, so relativity, and they are very small, so quantum. And Dirac then tried to bring these two theories together to make the theory of the electron. And in a profound way, he found that the books wouldn't balance properly. Sort of going back to my father, the accountant analogy, that the sums didn't work out right. He just couldn't get it to happen, unless the electron doesn't exist alone that the electron that you and I are made of and everything that we're made of and that flows like electric current through wires and you pay the company for providing them is a little negatively charged particle. And Dirac's equation said that there should also be a positively charged particle with all the same attributes as the electron except that the sign of its electric charge is opposite. And this became known as the positron what we today call the simplest example of antimatter. Now, that emerged out of Dirac's equations. Within a couple of years, experiment had discovered the positron. Cosmic rays are hitting the atmosphere from outer space all the time, and the energy of those rays can produce new particles, and we now know antiparticles, in particular positrons. So there is Dirac writing equations and then you go out and do an experiment and you find this weird stuff. How is it that the mathematics knows about the universe that we are part of? And then we go and find that the mathematics knew it before we did. It's, mm. it's very profound. Mm.